Hello, I'm Tim Reynolds. I'm a technologist here at Seafair. Our discussion today is going to be about the sonar that we use in, in the Sea Searcher as well as sonar in general. So one of the key uh, tools that are used by any archaeologist and any uh, explorer in the ocean is sonar. Sonar, um, if somebody's using sonar, for example, in their own boat, they'll be using a downscan sonar. That's your typical fish finder. And you can tell from what's in underneath the boat all the way down to the, to the ocean floor. That's one type of sonar. The second type of sonar people typically use is side scan sonar. That's popular these days and that allows you to see the structure that's on the bottom. Um, for us, the most important sonar is something called a sub-bottom sonar, which means it's looking from the ocean floor deep into the ocean floor because most of our shipwrecks are not sitting on the ocean floor that you can see it. So for example, on Melbourne Beach, if you were to strip away all of the water and look at the ocean floor, it would look like a desert. There would not be any obvious signs of a shipwreck on the ocean floor. The rare exception to that is after a hurricane or a storm when the sands may have shifted and partially uncovered some level of artifacts. Uh, but most of the time, it's below the ocean floor. So we designed a specific sonar to both image and locate objects below the ocean floor. So the Sea Searcher sonar, which is actually located all the way around the perimeter of the Sea Searcher, is designed uh, much like the eyes on your head. So we can tell the distance of an object and whether it's round or square, typically because we have two eyes in our head and, and that's called binocular vision. Well, in the case of the Sea Searcher, it's multi-vision. There's multiple sensors around the perimeter of the Sea Searcher. So as it's flying along above the ocean floor, the sonar is looking deep into the ocean floor and the sensors are using that, what we call aperture, the spatial change between the sensors to get an idea of the three-dimensional aspect of whatever's buried below the ocean floors. So one way we determine the size of an object is as the sea searchers flying along the ocean floor, we approach the object, we can see we're approaching it, passing over it, and then going past it. So we can tell not just the size of the object, the depth of the object, and even the hardness of the object. So sonar in the ocean is very interesting. On land, we're used to the speed of sound. Speed of sound is around 760 miles per hour. But once we go into the ocean, anybody that's a scuba diver knows that's the first thing they teach you is that the speed of sound is faster in the water. But even then, even beyond that, when it passes through an object, unlike uh, electromagnetic waves, sound changes its speed as it goes through an object. So for example, to pass through this iron cannonball, the harder the object is, the faster sound travels through that. The technical term for that is Doppler shift. It actually changes the frequency of the sound as it travels through it and the speed of the sound. So we detect that, that innate, that's part of what allows us to tell whether we're going through a piece of pottery, a stone, or an or a iron cannonball. So you might ask what makes the Sea Searcher's sonar different from a typical, what they call a sub-bottom profiler. There's a couple of things that are unique about it. One of the things is the sea searcher goes along the ocean floor just above the ocean floor, about three feet above the ocean floor. The second thing it does is it operates at a pretty low frequency band. And, and the reason is, is the higher the frequency, the more the sound is affected by the objects around it. So the things that affect sonar are uh, what we call turbidity, how much stuff is hanging around in the water. The second thing is the things that it's transferring through. So, for example, sand and shell and rubble and, and, and encrustations on things. So we try to pick a frequency and a, and a waveform that allows us to go through those objects and then it reflects back so that we can monitor it and, and image it and doesn't just get absorbed and not reflected. So what happens when sound gets transferred in, in the water and it hits an object like this, like a stone or like a cannonball, a certain amount of that sound gets reflected back. The reason that's called is that stone or that iron cannonball 
This is called an interface, the sonar interface. So when it hits that interface, a certain percentage of the sound reflects back and a certain percentage of the sound continues to transfer through the object. Every time there's an interface, whether it's the front of the stone, the back of the stone, the front of the pottery, front of the cannonball, rear, whatever, there's going to be a reflection. And that's what we're imaging when we pick, up, pick that up on the sea searcher as a reflection. One of the ways that we 3D image below the ocean floor, I talked about the aperture, is we actually take below the sea searcher and we divide it up much like you would divide up uh, an image into pixels. And we take each pixel below the sea searcher down to a pretty significant depth. And we say, what's the likelihood there's an object at that location? And based upon the probability that there's an object at that location on all of the sensors with all of the data that we collected, the machine learning system makes an assessment and says, this is the probability there is something there. And that's what we project back up for the user to see.